there a slide deck here? Can you all hear me? OK. So I'm going to go through this pretty fast. Uh, the future of NFTs is actually quite certain. Um, but we're going to go into chapter two. So there's a lot to cover here. I want to go through it fast. First, what the hell happened in 2020 and 2021? Because NFTs had been around for years. And then for some reason, they popped, and then they cratered. Uh, I want to take you through what I think happened. And as a little preview, it's actually quite consistent with way, the way the crypto market operates, which is really cyclical in nature. So this is a, a, a well-worn story. Crypto always follows this cycle. It's like the seasons. There's an innovation phase. That then leads to mania as people get excited and don't know how big it can be. Inevitably a crash. And then from there, a period of adjustment. Rinse, repeat. Always. So for all of you who are here, if you're here in 10 years, hopefully you'll say, oh yeah, that guy said this is going to happen quite a few times, and it does. So NFTs always are going to follow the same pattern of crypto because everything is correlated in crypto. This is uh, the Google Trends analysis. It shows how many searches are done. The peak there is the highest level ever. You see years go by. NFTs were around for a long time, and then suddenly, like a mountain, they just, they just soar. You want to know um, why? I think it's due to collectibles. Now, for those of you who were involved with NFTs prior to 2020, you'll know that they were always associated with video games. And the thing about video games is they're hard to build. They take a lot of money. They take a lot of creative effort. But with the advent of collectibles, and I think we were one of the first to launch a pack of those with Tops called Garbage Pail Kids, which was like a 1980s brand, uh, people realized you could launch an NFT without a game. They could exist in and of themselves. A lot of creativity, therefore, got unleashed. The barrier to entry really dropped, and it became a consumer phenomenon, which, of course, led to the arrival of the VCs. The VCs, they smell money, they want to get in, and they did, investing hundreds of millions of dollars at multi-billion dollar valuations, which I thought was not a good idea given the low barriers to entry for a lot of these projects. Then, of course, the crash. 2022, you guys lived through it if you were around then. Uh, venture money dried up. Everybody learned that venture capitalists are uh, fair weather friends. When the market looks cold, they abandon it. But that leads you to sentiment. Sentiment changed rapidly. We went from fear and greed index at over 95 uh, six months before the crash to here extreme fear. And by the way, it's only been below 10, I want to say maybe four or five times. So this is deep, deep extreme pessimism and despair. But as I said, there's another phase, which is the adjustment phase. We're in that in 2023. Crypto markets have probably doubled since the lows. And we've had a period of at least several weeks before uh, a new bankruptcy or another Ponzi scam being un unveiled. So people are starting to feel pretty good. Uh, this was taken a couple of days ago, but that's a solid number for sentiment if you're in the crypto space. But before we go and start building for the next cycle, I think it's valuable to explore what things did we develop in the last cycle that will likely endure, what things maybe are questionable, and what things hopefully will die. So these two clear keepers, 100% uh, on-chain applications. For those of you who are you know, students of blockchain, that means everything is done on-chain. And the value of that is simple. Ask people who put money into Celsius or Voyager or FTX. When people are managing it, you're not directly connecting with the blockchain. There's risk of things going wrong, people behaving badly. So high perceived safety. In the case of NFTs, you wouldn't be here if I didn't think that would endure. NFTs ushered in millions of people into the blockchain space. Hundreds of millions of NFTs were created. Billions of NFTs were traded. 
NFTs are gonna be here for a long time, and the next time in chapter two, they will be a lot more than something like digitally wrapping a media file, which is pretty much all chapter one was about. I'm not as sure about these two. Now, we could literally have an entire conference on my feelings of DAOs. DAOs, by the way, have been around for 30 years. For those of you who have been in the tech space, uh, they had a very nefarious early uh, uh, start, which kind of got whitewashed. DAOs have been around a long time. They really don't do what they're supposed to do. I see DAOs primarily as fundraising vehicles without having to uh, do any of the complicated stuff like filing Reg Ds and things that normally people would do. So I'm not a fan of them, especially because liabilities for people involved in them is very high. You're much better being protected within some sort of C-Corp or maybe an LLC. Metaverses, I love them, I'm a gamer, I've been in the game space for almost 30 years, but metaverses of the Ready Player One variety, that's not happening for at least 10 years. And the biggest hurdle we face today are, are technological. We need massive improvements in hardware and venture capitalists don't like investing in hardware because it's risky, expensive, and slow. So I think 10 years, could be 15, maybe eight, but it'll be a while before we see Ready Player One. The thing I would like to die is leverage. Uh, the, the length of time I've been in, involved in business has taught me that leverage is the toxin of capitalism. You can handle a little bit of it, a lot of it is a bad idea. All the exchanges were offering 125x leverage uh, prior to the market collapse. Uh, uncollateralized or poorly collateralized crypto loans. There was no leverage prior to 2020, almost none in the space. This was a significant factor in the collapse of crypto uh, in 2022. So enough with where we've been, let's talk about what comes next. Uh, this is something I learned as a, as a venture capitalist. New technologies always hit twice and the second time is way bigger than the first time. It's like uh, this image here. Uh, the first time a new technology is rolled out, it's generally applied to something you're already doing. It's, it's a better, faster, cheaper version of what you're already doing, paving over a, a, an existing road, metaphorically. Uh, that is good, that'll give you a 10x return, but that's not where venture capitalists like investing, because it's not transformative. The second wave is where you want to be. This is where people start to figure out how to use that new technology in a way that's never been done before. And the value of that is it gives you something that I consider the rarest element in the universe, which is a new business model. New business models are where all the real value is created. They're exceptionally hard to come up with because they take extreme insight into a new market or an existing market. And typically one or two or three per cycle, if th that many are created, would be remarkable. Very rare. But you get a 100x plus return, maybe more. So they're worth trying to get at. Priceline was a Web 1.0 company, and I consider one of the top three business models made in Web 1.0. The founder of Priceline, Jay Walker, his insight was there could be a marketplace for perishable items, for selling things like airline seats and hotel rooms right before they were going to expire. And the genius of his innovation was using a new technology called the internet and APIs and client server technology was that he allowed these businesses to maintain their high pricing schema but still sell things at a discount to people who would buy at the last minute. You could not do this before the internet. So that's an example of using a new technology in a way never done before. This was state of the art in travel distribution prior to Priceline. And this was what Jay Walker got out of it for inventing his business. So coming up with business model innovation is really where you wanna be when you're looking and exploring the use case of a new technology. 
I'd like to also point out here that we have had no industries that have gone extinct because of blockchain yet. Now, while you could say, wow, maybe blockchain isn't going to be the thing, I actually think that's a great thing because of what it says to me is the big breakthroughs haven't come yet. I'm going to wrap it up here by saying when it comes to NFTs, I'd like you all to think about what new technologies you're going to harness. Don't just think about the NFT technology itself. All of these particular technologies ultimately will want to be stitched together in some way to create what's going to be chapter two, which is NFTs with a lot more utility and a lot more value. And that's that. Thank you, William.